Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. We are back with another episode of Daily at Palantir. Hope you all had a good Thanksgiving, Black Friday. If you celebrated, got to spend some time with your family. We're back into the world of Palantir. Three things I want to discuss today. Number one, institutional holdings and how they're getting higher for Palantir. Want to discuss that with some of the stock action that we saw today, along with some macro stuff impacting the price. Number two, Sham Sankar, really interesting clip. He was asked about a question around Palantir being a successful company or not that I thought was, he had a really interesting answer for at the Venture Defense Summit. So I want to talk about that and share that clip. And then number three, NHS deal. We got that last week. Good for Palantir long term. Stock kind of slowed off on the news. Palantir published an official article talking about their response to everything that's been going on uh, around the basically media backlash uh, they've gotten since winning the award. So I want to talk about their response and how they're essentially framing their ability to be able to do what the NHS needs them to do. Been a busy weekend, Thanksgiving, Black Friday. Let's get back into Daily Palantir. All right, so let's start off with uh, some stock action today and what we saw with Palantir. We fell below 19 bucks. I think we got to around 1870 in the market as we were covering it live on the market open. Um, and then we quickly regained that $19 range. And so it's been really kind of interesting to see how this has been playing out for Palantir here. Uh, $19.05 in the after hours, uh, we are down about 0.63% for the day and 0.16% um, after hours. In general, again, this is kind of what we expected when the stock ran up to $21.85. Probably we're going to see some volatility to the downside. The question simply becomes now going forward over the next couple of weeks as we are in the midst of what I think is a Santa Claus rally. I mean, the S&P 500 is up 8% in the past month alone. We are in a rally. The question simply becomes, is that rally sustainable enough to keep going higher to new heights? And if it is sustainable enough, to go to new heights, is Palantir going to be with it going to new heights? Or is this level going to be flat? Or does it come down because it's gotten too overbought and people feel that there needs to be a little bit of a retracement? One thing that's interesting to think about when we're talking about Palantir in particular from a macro perspective is this one stat here that we have talked about many times on this show. Definitely on the market open if you're part of that. But money market funds, how much money is in money markets? These are risk-free funds that can get you 5% off your money because the federal fund rate, the uh, interest rates in the United States of America are five and a half. Total money market fund assets increased by $29 billion last week to $5.76 trillion. Basically got $6 trillion sitting on the sidelines, not in the stock market. And so when we think about a company like Palantir, some can argue it's overvalued. Some can argue it's undervalued. Whatever you're arguing, the one thing you can't argue with is that there's $6 trillion that are on the sidelines waiting to potentially come back into the stock market. And the reason they would come into the stock market probably within if the next interest rate cut uh, by the Fed is in March, that is that time. Or if it's in May, then it's from now until May. It tends to happen before interest rates get cut. I mean, like these people kind of figure out, financial advisors figured out, all right, interest rate cuts are definitely happening here before they cut them and the market goes bananas. Why don't you put your money in there, which is going to make the market also go bananas in the anticipation of that rate cut. So that's $6 trillion that has to find a home, regardless of what you think is overvalued, undervalued, the market needs uh, companies to allocate capital to. Uh, and that's really all the market is. Some of that capital is not in the market right now. It's in money market funds. I believe it is going to come into the market, not all $6 trillion, but there will be some money coming back into the markets. And the question simply becomes, then is Palantir going to be able to get some of that? Along with that, we've got institutional holdings. So Palantir's institutional ownership, this is by Crossroads tweeted today, is nearing 40%. We were at 34% for a while. So it's nice to see him get to that 40% level uh, over the past six months. Uh, he says, I still would be surprised if we see this much over 50% anytime soon. We in retail own this stock. And I agree with him. I mean, retail is primarily the owners of Palantir. It is nice to see that there are more institutional holders beginning to own the stock at a higher level. Uh, this is about 850 million shares now owned by institutional investors. And uh, then you got retail that is making up the rest of that. Along with that, speaking of Palantir stock price and valuations, overvalued, undervalued, we've got Snowflake, a considered competitor to Palantir. It's questionable if they're actually competing with Palantir, but definitely in the data space. Uh, has earnings this week on November 29th, two days from now. And I did a quick little... Uh, review of both Snowflake and Pounder right here. Snowflake's market cap is 56 billion. Pounder's market cap is 42 billion. So there's a nice delta of around 16 billion in market cap. There are 14 billion between the two. Snowflake's growth is 30% year over year. Pounder's growth is 17%. That is the one reason investors will point to the delta of valuation change because Snowflake's growing faster. And then Snowflake is not gap profitable. People actually don't know that. Snowflake has not made a 
gap profit. Pounder is four quarters of gap profits. Now, could Snowflake get gap profitable tomorrow? Yes, but obviously they're sacrificing that profitability for growth. Pounder decided, you know what? If we're not going to be able to grow as fast as Snowflake, or we're not going to be able to get to that 30% CAGR given whatever extenuating circumstances that are uh, stopping them from getting that growth, let's at least focus on gap profitability because gap profitability gets us into the S&P 500 eventually, and gap profitability will probably make the stock go up because obviously shareholders will be more happier that the company is um, performing in a way that allows them to be more fiscally responsible. So at the end of the day, I think we're seeing this $19 line. Could it go lower than this? Yes. Could it come back up to higher levels? Yes. If money market funds and the rally continues, could this go higher? Yes. If Palantir is perceived as not having enough institutional holdings or not growing as fast as Snowflake or not deserving of the premium, could we go lower? Yes. I think the next couple of weeks are going to be really interesting if we stay at this level or if we pick one way to the upside or downside. Um, because eventually the market is going to have to make a decision. The question simply becomes, where is the market going to make that decision for Pound here? Okay, the next clip I want to show is a really interesting clip. Uh, I found this here from Sham Sankar. So Sham Sankar gave a talk last week, seven days ago, at the Defense Venture Summit. And this was a really interesting talk. And the reason for that is because he was basically explaining why uh, VCs, venture capitalists, are now so interested in funding defense tech companies. The reason? Russia, Ukraine, potential China, Taiwan, Israel, Hamas. Like we're seeing so much geopolitical conflict across the world. You're seeing big countries that are part of NATO that have fat budgets that are willing to spend a lot of money, not even including the United States, that, you know, they are ready to invest in AI, machine learning, all that stuff that keeps us safe, secure, et cetera. And a lot of that investing is not going to the hardware side of defense tech. It's the software side of defense tech. And then you think of, you know, what is the greatest software company in the world that is in defense tech? I would personally think it's Palantir. So at that summit, someone asked Sham, hey, why is Palantir a successful a company if like you raised a ton of money and you don't have that much revenue? Um, like, why are you giving the lecture basically for defense tech? That was the tone of the question. Uh, it was really funny because a lot of people at the summit were like, were like, really? Did you just ask that question? Like, you hear the audience like, what? He's asking this question. Here's his response uh, to that question. I think it's an interesting thing. And it said some, it, it shed some insight in Pounder's role in defense tech that I think also speaks to their massive moat when it comes to government business. Yeah, and sorry about the accent. Maybe that doesn't help. So the VC said that, that the Palantir is not a good example mm. of building a successful defense-related company because you guys raised shitload of money, like 5.5, but your revenue is only, only 1.5 billion. So Two billion, but yes. That's, Two that's billion, okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I just I quickly really Googled that and it said 1.5. 500 million, let me tell you. I like it. Um, I yeah, look, I, there, there's a path dependency here that can't be, can't, it, it can't be underestimated. I, this is the pioneers get arrows thing. I, I can't tell you how hard it was. I hope it's easier now. I hope that that's the whole point of going down that trail. And I hope to actually put my money where my mouth is and show you that I can make it easier, that I can make your capital deployment more efficient for the portfolio companies that are in this room to get to scale faster. So much of this stuff was busy waiting. So much of this stuff is like some person didn't want to sign the paper on accreditation. So much of this stuff is figuring it out the first time. There is no process. Then there, there, there's no end for the government to look at and say, what should we be doing? So the only way to succeed is by pissing everyone off, which just then causes so much additional drag. So I don't know that all these problems are solved. I kind of structurally doubt it. I, I kind of think, you know, we had to sue the Army, SpaceX had to sue the Air Force. I, I, there, there are more services. And, and you know, like, I wish I could say these lessons like globalize, but my experience has been they don't. And, you know, uh, like we use the same lawyers. I'd be happy to refer them to anyone here when you get to that place. Um, and I wish I could say, like, I think about the counterfactual all the time. It's like, God, to the point of the brain damage and my fear of, like, could I do this again? I, you know, again, I, I think I'd, I've already answered that question. It's like, was there a less painful way to do this? Could it have been done differently? And I get to the same place every time, which is no. I think, like, the, the pathing where the market was, what the buyers were receptive to, how the monopsonists behaved and what they wanted to do. Um, you know, I think ho hopefully it's just easier for everyone else now. Oh, that one I thought that was a really good response for a couple of reasons. Basically, the guy's like, so these VCs told us Pounder is not a good example of a defense tech company because they raised $5.5 but they're only doing $2 billion in revenue. And um, as a result of that, you know, they're not like the success story that we think they are. And Sham's answer was, look, the reason you VCs are even interested in defense tech company right now is because of a company like Pounder, because of a company like SpaceX. Pounder had to sue the army 
to have meritocratic procurement of software because it used to just be political. Now it's based on which software is actually the best. That was the whole point of the court case, and they won. SpaceX had to sue the Air Force because blah, 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 bureaucracy. This, this contract is not going to this person. This contract's not going to this person. This one's taking too long. You know what? We'll just sue you guys because in America, you're allowed to sue the government if you think something is being done in an unjust way. So when he's saying, you know, for the past 20 years, a lot of it was this person not signing off or this person taking too long or this person not sending the right email. All of that has culminated into what Palantir is offering today which is FedStart. And we've talked about FedStart many, many times on this channel, but FedStart is their SaaS offering to startups that are raising hundreds of millions of dollars from VCs. So far, uh, 17, 18 billion has been invested this year in defense tech companies, and that's probably gonna end out to 30, 40 billion by the end of the year, given last year was about 30 billion. All that money needs a home. And if it's going to these startups that have a primary client, which is the US government, right? Defense tech, you need to sell to the government. In order to sell to the government, you need to make sure you're accredited, make sure you have the right confidential uh, security ram uh, uh, platforms, you're containerized in a way that makes sure data is not misused. And all of that is offered through Palantir's FedStar. But more importantly, all of that is offered because Palantir spent 20 years trying to figure this out. So I love when people are like, oh, well, you know, Palantir's been around for 20 years, but it's like, dude, if something's been around for 20 years, you should probably take it a little bit more seriously that it's been able to survive for 20 years. And now you have a chance to actually participate in the company's future success because they've been around for 20 years. So I think the argument that they raise a lot of money and they're doing less in revenue than they raise in money to me is ridiculous because like to even have a company like Palantir exist, you need a lot of money in the beginning to start it up. That's the whole nature of a startup. And the only thing that was funding Palantir at the time was InQtel, which is the CIA's VC fund. And then the regular VCs, Sham talks about, didn't even invest after they said, if InQtel invests, then we'll invest. They still never invested. So I think Palantir has really shaped, SpaceX has shaped, Andril has shaped the modern defense tech ecosystem we have today. And I think that defense ecosystem in terms of TAM is getting larger. I think it's going global and international given all the geopolitical events we've seen. And I think that means Palantir is TAM to be able to capture that opportunity or to be able to take a piece off every startup trying to capture that opportunity because they can offer the platform for them to be able to do that is increasing as well. So that was a great answer by Sham. Just wanted to show you guys that someone tried to be smart with him in the audience and he kind of just said, you know what? We worked really hard to get here and uh, hopefully what we've done over the past 20 years can make it easier for you guys trying to start new things to keep innovating in defense tech. All right, last thing I wanna discuss is Palantir's latest blog around the NHS. So this is a blog post that they put out basically talking about what they're doing with the NHS. And there's one paragraph I wanted to read that I thought was really interesting. A lot of it is the typical stuff they always talk about, but here was the part of the article where they're talking about data processing versus data controlling. And for anyone that's still confused about what they do, still confused about what they do with the NHS, I thought these two paragraphs were really good in the broader article. I'll put the article in the description to at least get people to understand more broadly what Pounter's trying to do with data in regards to the NHS. So Pounter says, with regards to customer data, we act as a data processor, not a data controller. Our customers license our software and decide how they want to use it. They retain full control and ownership of the data they hold, defining what can and cannot be done with that data. Pounter is granted no rights to that data and can only carry out activity that we are instructed to do by the customer. Many of our contracts are public and set all of this out clearly. So in the first paragraph, they're basically trying to say, look, you know, we do not own the data. We are allowing the data to be processed through our software. That software has a lot of patents. That software has been worked on for 20 years. That software has a moat. It's very difficult to get that software, but we don't need the, we don't need to monetize the data by selling it. We just need the data to be integrated into the software so that you get better results from the software. That is the entire relationship Pounder has with the customer, not the sort of uh, monetization cycle that a lot of the other big tech companies have, which is that they need the data to monetize something external, usually our attention. That's just not the company Palantir is. And the problem is in the UK media, that's what they think they are, given the whole evil spy tech framing, or they're gonna sell that data to the government and then like show up at your house because they have a virtual you know, um, representation of who you are. It's like, that's not real. Maybe in the movies, that's fine. In China, they definitely do that with like social capital. And like there's certain apps where if it'll tell you if you're in the proximity of someone who has less social capital, like that's a real thing in China. That's not Palantir. <laughs> Palantir is just trying to make the software more easier for the clients that they're using it, which means they need the data. That's all. They say we do not and cannot reuse or transfer our customers' data for our own purposes. Attempting to profit from customer data in this way would be illegal and would undermine the trust that is necessary to work in the sensitive environments in which we have built our business. And look, even if you don't believe them there, where they're saying, oh, it's illegal, it wouldn't work. Just look at their revenue numbers. They're not making any money from selling the data. They're making money from licensing the software, from selling the software. So it's like, 
it, just like if money runs the world, there is not even a profit incentive for Palantir to be able to take your data, steal it, and sell it to someone else, much less how obviously that would be exposed if they were doing that because this is they work with very sensitive data. They wouldn't be getting these clients if they were doing that with sensitive data, but they don't even make any money off of it. So it's just like, it's, it's such a ridiculous claim. And if anyone is in the UK and is still concerned, or you have friends and family that's concerned, take the chapter of part of this YouTube video where I say NHS, Palantir response, and just send that to them. Just send it to them. And just like, like maybe if they hear me ramble about this for three, four minutes, they'll finally get it. But Palantir is not stealing your data. They don't need your data. The reason they won against every other firm that was competing for this contract is because they have the best tech. The UK knows they have the best tech, and that's why Palantir won the contract. All right, that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Daily Palantir. I will see you guys tomorrow. Hope you guys had a good Thanksgiving and Black Friday. And yeah, let's keep this going. See you guys tomorrow, everybody. Bye-bye.